Welcome, welcome to International FDS Day. Thank you to everyone for coming. Um, for people who don't know, my name's Chloe. I'm the Victorian Project Officer for FDS in this state. And just in general, um, I'm so excited to see so many people here who are interested in progressing the needs of families to have a voice about issues that matter to them. And particularly, for people that have been on this journey of supporting someone, you know, with substance use and with alcohol use. Um, this is the sixth annual interna international FDSA that we've had so far um, in, in this state. So we've been supporting families for about 22 years um, on this journey of supporting someone on drugs and alcohol. And that means that it's been about two decades that we've been delivering our national support line we do support groups for families, as well as our flagship program, Stepping Stones to Success for Families as well. We also have face-to-face -face and of course, online delivery methods too. But today is actually a really special day for us at FDS. But our organisation started really because our CEO um, lost his son to a heroin overdose um, in 1997. And today actually commemorates the anniversary uh, or marks the day um, of his son's Damien's passing. And, and this day in particular, this particular year of, of International FDS Day um, is an interesting one because it's actually been um, 23 years since, since 1997. And Damien, of course, was 23 years old at the time. So I think that there's a special sort of significance and ring to today on this particular year. So interestingly, this also marks Tony's journey and beginning to found FDS. And I think that, you know, much to, you know, the pioneering work of many people um, including Tony and many other family organisations that have now sort of step up into the AOD space or stepped up um, and really kind of um, fill a bit of a, a gap in the service system that existed back then. I think it's fair to say that now families enjoy, you know, much more empathetic service provision as well as a, a broader recognition for the important role that they play in, in choosing to continue to be to remain connected and, and to support their loved one or family member. And ultimately this is about achieving better outcomes and we know that if the family is engaged and if they are involved that it's not just better outcomes for the family but of course the person who's using and everyone just in general. You know our organisation you know it doesn't condemn or condone substance use. Our model is really informed by, by expertise and also um, by evidence about what works and doesn't work. We also recognise that sometimes, you know, while abstinence may be the best form of harm reduction or the gold standard of harm reduction, for many people, uh, particularly if you have a dependency on substances, you know, Expecting somebody to just say no or immediately cease their use is, is unrealistic. So, you know, for, for us as staff, we really believe that people deserve access to universal healthcare regardless of their substance use, use, use preference. And this includes tailored programs, such as needle and syringe programs, safe injecting centres, drug checking services, and pill testing, of which we will hear more about from Tony in his video today. Importantly, would also just like to recognise a number of the family members um, who are in the room today and many who have actually travelled from various parts of Victoria um, to be with us. And um, I think, you know, that means being recognised for the valuable work that they do um, in continuing to support, lobby and remain connected to their son, daughter, 
family member, grandchildren, parents that have a substance use issue. I think it's very common for families to feel really too afraid and um, scared of reaching out to, to the community or reaching out for support, largely because there is so much shame attached to this issue. Um, and of course, we know that there's a lot of stigma that is put on to people who use drugs and their families by the wider society. So we believe that Australian families deserve a lot better and should actually be championed for the work that they do, um, which is really um, an important community service, but more to the point, and what we see in our programs a lot of the time, is families implementing default harm minimization and harm reduction practices in their own home. They're, they're doing their own harm reduction programs. Um, and that work, let's not um, forget, is, is, re is real work and it's life-saving work. Uh, so that means keeping important members of our community alive long enough so they have the opportunity to recover from their substance use or that period in their lives that might be categorised by problematic use. So I think for myself, uh, there's a lot to be said for cultural validation around these issues, as we know that uh, a lot of what happens and what we're here to talk about today is so often sort of concealed behind closed doors. There's a shroud of secrecy around these things. And what that means is that, you know, only a few select people are really sort of involved or included. And we know that drug use and substance use, it doesn't discriminate. So it affects every single sector of our society, from lawyers and politicians to artists and social workers, tradespeople. It's much like domestic violence. And yet, you know, the truth of this sort of situation is that it affects every single one of us. We're all touched by this issue in one way or another and in varying degrees. Um, yet, you know, I also can understand that it's so normal to really internalise a lot of these you know, these messages that we get from, you know, from the environment, from what's around us, these myths that we hear about substance use and people who use drugs. <coughs> so also quickly, um, would like to recognise that we have a number of politicians in the room today as well, and some of who have made some significant contributions to drug policy discussions, as well as, um, you know, implement a very successful um, harm reduction um, programs and policies in, in Victoria. So we have leader of the Australian Reason Party, Fiona Patton MP from the Legislative Council. Welcome Fiona. Thank you. We have Dr Tim Reid from the Australian Greens, member of Brunswick, a member of the Legislative Assembly. Tim. Thanks. And we have David Limbrick, a member of the Liberal Democrats, as well as of the Legislative Council as well. Welcome, David. So we might start with the formal proceedings for today now. <laughs> um, so just to, to kick off, um, I would like to start by um, doing an acknowledgement of country and recognising the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land that we're on today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome anyone who identifies as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander into the room today. Uh, sovereignty was never ceded in Australia and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So we might start uh, with our CEO, Tony, who has just done a welcome video for everybody today and also to talk about the theme of this year's International FDS Day too, and then we'll hear from our speakers. I want to warmly welcome you to this event, which is one of many events being held around Australia and the rest of the world to celebrate International Family Drug Support Day. We started this event in 2016, so this is now the sixth year that we've held it. Over the years, we've had a number of themes, some of which have been drug users are good people, 
Drug use can happen in any family, and by supporting families, we improve the outcomes, not just for the family, but also for the substance user and the community at large. Today's focus is one on family connection is a better policy than tough love. Some people think that being tough with drug users is the way to go, that they have to hit a rock bottom, that they have to uh, avoid dying and going to prison, and that somehow by reminding them of these negatives, that somehow they'll change their drug use. In fact, over the years, we've seen many, many people deal positively with drug use, and it's usually been with a vision of something better, a purpose that leads them away from some of the negative and destructive things they're doing. We believe that families should stay connected. That doesn't mean that families have to be doormats. It doesn't mean that they have to be uh, abused or, or dealt with negatively by the substance user, but it does mean that people can stay connected. It is sometimes necessary to get interventions. It is sometimes necessary for families to ask the substance user to leave the home. But it can be done through connection. It doesn't mean that you have to abandon them. It doesn't mean that you throw them out on the streets and never have anything more to do with them. We have, from time to time, unfortunately, had families who've come to us who've practiced tough love. And it's listening to their stories, of course, that make us realize that tough love is a very, very risky thing to do. Some people have lost all connection with the person that they formerly loved. Some people have even lost them to suicide or to drug overdoses. That is something that should never happen. I also want to remind you that we are still focused on reforming drug laws. We need to change policy. We have to have policies that keep people safe and alive. So listen to these stories, listen to the courageous people who are, who are here today to talk to you and please support families, it's really important. That's why this event is taking place. Um, for our first speaker, we have Sam Biondo, CEO of VADA, uh, Victoria's Alcohol and Other Drug Association. Welcome, Sam. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be invited to, to today's event. Uh, thanks, Chloe, and um, thanks to Tony. Pass on my thanks to Tony. Um, one has to acknowledge the courage and the determination that Tony's had over so many years in this space. Uh, he's an incredible man, and it's, this is an incredible um, organisation. And uh, I really respect the work uh, that it does. I respect the work that many of the other family uh, support organisations, of which there's not too many, in fact, uh, do uh, in Victoria and across the country. So be before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on and pay my respect to elders past and present and emerging. I'd like to, to, um, uh, to acknowledge um, that the... Uh, I've sort of, I've sort of acknowledged the the, the, uh, the work that these organisations do, but um, it's we, we must remember what they actually do in supporting the families. We've got to acknowledge that these families would be lost without uh, this sort of support. In many ways, families do it on their own, very much so. But if we're able to bring people together and uh, allow them to share and support one another, it really does does help um, individuals. It does help in cutting through a lot of the unknowns um, and you're not alone and that's really, really important. Um, it helps address the stigma which impacts everybody in this space. Alcohol and drugs uh, is an easy term to say, but when you think about it, uh, there's so much stigma, so much anxiety, so much uh, pain involved in this that anything that can be done to help relieve that sort of pressure um, is really, really important. Uh, we note that this year's theme of family connection, not tough love, uh, it's a really interesting title. For me, this speaks to questions of evidence and what works and what doesn't work in addressing AOD dependency and the harms. The dictum of what works is least popular and what doesn't work is most popular. 
So when you look at the policy frame that happens, um, it's the things that don't work that often get done, and the things that do work uh, don't get done. Um, what we need to bring to this space is a sense of pragmatism, uh, practical policies that work. And I often refer to things that happen in Norway and, and in and, uh, Holland, uh, the Netherlands, of uh, practical initiatives that can make a difference. Um, they seem not to worry about the what people will think about the issue. They go to the nub of what needs to be done to deal with the issue. And that's, that's really where we need to focus our policy initiatives. You know, we've got some great practitioners here who are in Parliament who are very pragmatic in their thinking. Um, and we need to move people's uh, attention and their thinking um, along these pragmatic lines. Uh, too often we hear harms of criticism of harm prevention initiatives like pill testing, medically supervised injecting facilities, decriminalisation, diversion um, from, from uh, the courts um, and the like. Uh, often they're targeted in the mis misbelief that they encourage uh, an increased use. On the horizon, as, as, as we all know, the narrative of compelling people into treatment with expectation that we've that refusal attracts punishment. We've seen that uh, this notion of, of forcing people into treatment uh, is really problematic and we only need to think of what's happening in the welfare space and drug testing in that space. Um, the implied inference is that people are choosing to use and choosing to be dependent reflects not only on individuals but also on the family. The implication being that something was done wrong, that the fault lies with the family. Such unhelpful notions simply enforce a sense of stigma, which uh, we know deters help-seeking behaviours, not only for the individual, but for the family. It's stigma that's our main driver deterring people from accessing help. We know nationally up to half a million people uh, in need of treatment, but can't access it. Stigma is a significant factor perpetuating preventable harms across individuals, families and communities. Furthermore, stigma impairs harm reduction policy development, where proponents of drug dependence as a choice see harm reduction as an enabler. They fail to see the pervasive, pervasiveness of AOD use across the community. Um, we know that 43% of Australians have used illicit drugs and uh, are not sympathetic to the harms, um, to these harms that could be reduced. These views cost lives, they set a narrative of deserving and undeserving. They span well beyond AOD policy to welfare, justice, housing, primary health space, and where people with substance dependence are often being denied service. They stop sensible policy. In concluding, we know what works and how to save lives and prevent harms. It's, it's most often accessible treatment, support for families, various harm reduction measures such as pill testing, supervised injecting. We know the harms of prisons and the correctional quagmire as people cycle in and out of prison with many lost opportunities for active treatment. We know that for many pharmacotherapy works but how difficult it is to access in, the, in some regions. We constantly hear the tired rhetoric of breaking down silos and integrating care but beyond the rhetoric, there's been little support to date to progress these actions. We recognise the effectiveness of peer work, yet we need broader support and understanding in this. Finally, we need a comprehensive approach to breaking down stigma. So thank you very much. Our second speaker today um, is leader of the Australian Reason Party, Fiona Patton. Um, thanks, Fiona. Um, thanks very much, Chloe, and uh, and 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 thank you, thank you all who are here today for for, for everything that you do. Um, it's it, it's not easy, and it's and it's remarkable. And in, in thinking about what I was going to speak about today, I you know spent some time writing some notes, but um, I doubt that I will even look at them. Uh, but I will try and keep to five minutes. Um, I, I, um, I just thought politics is 
is personal. Personal is politics. And and I, and I heard someone being chastised, uh, chastising the Prime Minister about this this morning, um, saying, look, you know what, he had to think about his daughters before he could think about the women who worked in Parliament. And, and but the first thing I was thinking about this morning was um, my uh, a, a very close part of my family, who um, we called the ambulance twice to our home when she had overdosed in the bathroom. And, and there was a time when we just didn't think she was going to make it. You know, we, we, we didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to turn. Um, there was a family support group in Canberra, which was, was wonderful, but there wasn't a lot of support they could offer apart from just being at the end of the phone for us. Now, she is a wonderful woman today. She has two children. She's a professional. She's, um, she has a professional job helping others. And um, we are so lucky. And when I think of, of Tony and I think of Damien, and I think that um, uh, our family member was about the same age. And so it was probably 23 years ago that we were we were dealing with this, but we were one of the lucky ones in that that our loved one came through. But politics is personal, and as I say, this is probably a uh, drug law reform is probably one of the most explicit areas where this is literally about people's lives. And governments spend billions of dollars dealing with drug use in our society, and we don't spend it well. And um, Sam has been a constant reminder of how poorly we spend that money. I think yesterday the coroner reporting on how poorly we spent that money in drug treatments in prisons. And um, she made some very strong recommendations which um, I, I hope our governments will listen to. But I also reflect on, um, and I think, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. Let's treat drug use as a health issue, not a criminal one. And yet we still insist on criminalising people. And that creates the stigma. That creates, you know, I, I'm, I'm realising that stigma today because I'm not willing to say the name of that person, um, that, that loved one. I, I, I don't want to to put that stigma on her today. And so there, it, we still have not dealt with that stigma and we must, and we can. And there's things that governments can do. And, and part of that is the work that you do in telling your stories and in being out there. And I know that that is hard. And I know that it's really hard to even tell um, other family members about what you're going through. And I remember Sherry Short saying to me when I first met her, I told everyone in my family that my son died of a car accident. And I know she's not alone. So what can we do? We can change this. We have a three pillar approach to drug law, to, to, the, to, um, to the way we treat drugs in, in our society. We need four pillars. Treatment and support needs to have its own pillar. It needs to be just as important as enforcement, prevention, and, and the rest. Um, seeing my colleagues here today, and I know you know we may disagree on many things over over the the cut and thrust of, poli of Parliament, but I know that these are things that we are completely unified on today. And drug law reform, decriminalise the use and possession of drugs, re refocus our expenditure on drugs into support and help, look at rehabilitation, start talking about this as a health issue. And I know, you know, it's, we, ugh, I don't want to keep repeating that, but that would enable us to start having those conversations at the GP, at the doctor, sometimes maybe being able to talk about something before it's a problem. So I hope that today um, is, is just, is another, you know, it's, it's not a, it's a bump, it's not a, as, as all of you know here, you know, helping your loved ones is not a straight line um, and drug law reform is not a straight line, but I'd probably like to suggest to my colleagues and put them on the spot, but maybe um, we need a parliamentary friends of drug law reform group and maybe we just started it today. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, so our third speaker today, um, we have CEO of Harm Reduction Victoria, Sione Crawford. Thanks, Sione. Um, thank you, Chloe. Um, I probably will stick to my notes because um, uh, this is quite quite a tricky uh, uh, talk I'm going to go through because um, some of this uh, speaks to some of the stuff that Fiona just spoke about around disclosure and and stigma. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Tony in particular. Um, worked with Tony over many years, New South Wales, Canberra, and now Melbourne. I'm really glad um, that's 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 continuing, and I'm so uh, proud to see this day <coughs> um, be, being celebrated and, and, and supported in this way. So, for those of you who don't know, um, Harm Reduction Victoria is a, a peer-based organisation for people who use illicit drugs in Victoria. And what that means is that the people that work there are drug users. So that includes myself. Uh, we deliver programs uh, of peer education and support across a range of um, a range of areas, including bloodborne viruses prevention, treatment. Um, we do harm reduction at uh, events and festivals. The amazing uh, Dancewise program. Uh, we support people who are on pharmacotherapy, who are, who are trying to get into pharmacotherapy, you know, methadone and, and buprenorphine. Uh, we do overdose, opioid overdose and um, amphetamine overdose prevention uh, workshops, including the Loxone provision. And we do advocacy uh, across the sector and um, in, in particular um, uh, with, our, um, with our friends in uh, government and parliament. Um, so, what we know at Harm Reduction Victoria, and I think probably everyone in this room really knows, is that lived experience of drug use is, is actually very diverse. Some of us develop uh, dependence, uh, and many of us uh, do not. And our, our work at Harm Reduction Victoria really um, needs to go across that whole continuum. But because really, no matter the situation, harm reduction practice is about empowering people to be as safe as possible and to maintain dignity um, for as long as possible. Uh, while we use drugs, which is not always easy given the circumstances that often um, exist around, uh, particularly illicit drug use. In my experience though, family and friends play a, a really important role in harm reduction. And um, that's something that I think Tony alluded to in his video today. Um, and as he also alluded to, it's, it's true that family, that for many people, family relationships can become really complex and strained when it comes to drug use. And as a result, for many of us who use drugs, we're missing that relationship with our family. Um, I'm from a big family. I've got four brothers, a sister, and dozens of cousins. Uh, I grew up with my grandparents in the house. Um, and speaking like personally as a person uh, who uses drugs, I'm pretty certain that the, the love and acceptance of my family, and specifically their instinct to practice harm reduction, um, although they wouldn't have called it that at the time, has contributed to keeping me alive. Uh, when my mum found a syringe in uh, the washing machine after I went home from uni for a, for a holidays or something like that, uh, rather than kick me out uh, or freak out massively, she sat down and talked me through, um, you know, clean syringes and making sure that I was staying at least as safe as possible. I, I know for a fact, you know, uh, she was worried and stressed, but what I knew immediately was that she loved me and that she wanted to get through uh, this process with me. And and uh, it, what that also meant was that by being able to be honest in that way, um, we didn't let each other down probably as often as we could have over the period um, of, of, of problematic drug use. And I think this point is, is, is really important. Um, stigma around drug use is still alive and well, as we've, as we've heard, as others have said today already, and too often, unfortunately, it starts at home for us. And this leads really quickly to shame. None of us, well, very few of us who use uh, drugs, um, you know, want to put our families in difficult situations. And often it's the shame, it's our shame as well. Um, that often starts the process and cycle of dishonesty, which is very hard to break. In my experience, there was very little that my family could do uh, to stop me using drugs, um, especially when I had a when I have a physical dependency. But there's a huge amount they could do to support me to be as safe as possible while using it, and that's what they did. Unfortunately, I know amongst my friends and and, and colleagues that sadly 
um, not usual. Um, most, many are alienated, uh, if not completely ostracised from their family and instead turn to friends to be family. And to me, that's a genuine tragedy, knowing how important my family and uh, knowing through the work of Tony and, and others in the family drug space, family drug support space, um, knowing how important they have been to supporting people across the continuum of drug use. So really, I just want to uh, wind up by thanking um, uh, family drug support and other you know family uh, dr drug support organizations and family drug help here in Victoria for promoting harm reduction uh, and ultimately for supporting uh, us as drug users to be safe as possible and to maintain some dignity. Thank you. Our fourth speaker today is Cassandra. Um, Cassandra is a member of our volunteer team and is um, on our telephone line. Thanks, Cass. Thanks. Hi, it's an honour to be here today and thanks to FDS for inviting me to speak. My experience is primarily as a volunteer on the phone line. I'm also a mother of two teenage girls and completing a degree in health science and counselling. In my capacity as youth mental health first aid teacher, I have the privilege of travelling to work for the Youth Involvement Council in South Headland, Western Australia, up in the Pilbara Desert. This is Gadiana country. Youth Involvement Council, like Family Drug Support, is an amazing organisation who work with over 750 youth each year through their many outreach and development programs. 90% are Aboriginal and at least half are experiencing extreme levels of risk in their lives. We're talking six-year-olds with substance use disorders in communities with the highest child suicide rates in the world. And these are Australia's children and this work is so important and important for it to be Indigenous led. As part of my professional development, I attended a workshop with the inspiring Dr. Tracy Westerman, who was the first Aboriginal woman to receive a PhD in psychology. She's initiated many brilliant and innovative projects, including setting up a scholarship for Aboriginal people who want to study psychology and a whole different system for psychometric testing within an Indigenous cultural context. Her research and practice points to the fact that movement towards healing needs to encompass the whole community, to listen, to ask questions that elicit stories, to yarn, and to yarn with the grandparents, the elders, aunties, sisters, brothers, cousins, lovers, and friends. I gained a lot from the week's workshop, taking a key insight from Dr. Westerman's important work that substance misuse is a symptom of trauma, not the cause of it. This clearly asks of us as a society to meet these issues through a lens of compassion rather than a punitive one. The only sensible action to take is to divest from incarceration and divert that funding instead into much needed health and community services. This framework of moving towards healing in Indigenous communities is useful to consider when looking at family drug support's brilliant ethos and work over the last two decades. At FDS, we also try to incorporate the whole community. We do empathy. We honour our caller's experience in a non-judgmental way so that people can be heard and validated in their suffering without shame or blame. We don't give advice or solutions. What we do give family members is the space to feel how they're feeling without judgment. We offer the people, we offer people the space for a yarn. We use motivational interviewing so callers can explore ways connect, to connect with their loved ones through the haze and pain of substance misuse, and also explore ways they can reconnect and stay connected to themselves. A common thread I found amongst among callers is yes, the harms caused to loved ones by the substances themselves. Yet the dominating perpetual harm is the criminalization and the punitive measures taken towards users as a result. Not only does FDS provide a 24 hour phone, uh, phone service, we run groups, the innovative and unique Stepping Stones program, which further educate and nourish our families. We offer a referral service which connects families with other organisations, for example, where they can educate themselves about substances. 
Yet wouldn't it be fabulous if our young people had socially pertinent and reality-based education at school to begin with? Yeah, yeah. Okay, we've come a fair way from just say no. Yet, for example, my 15-year-old daughter and her friends were given no real information about cannabis in their drug education program at school. I'm sure most parents don't want their children to take drugs, including myself. Like, sure, wouldn't it be great if they could all play in the orchestra and be tucked into bed at 10 o'clock each night? I've told my daughters that if they try drugs, they might actually really like it. And there may, may be no apparent harms, which then opens up honest discussions around set and setting and quality control. Don't get me wrong, this has never been a permission slip. You know, it's important as parents to set boundaries for our kids. You know, so these discussions were always followed up by like, I don't want you to use drugs, yet take care. Brain chemistry is a precious, balanced brain chemistry is a precious commodity. Substance use touches everyone in society. I'm hopeful that we can all begin to be more straightforward with the realities we are faced with. Drugs are here to stay, as they always have been. And if we're really honest, many humans use drugs without any harm. And it is with this honesty and integrity, we can clear a path for the people that drugs are harming so that they and their loved ones are treated with dignity and respect. I'm really grateful for Family Drug Support for providing such a fantastic platform whereby I can use my own experiences and skills to be part of weaving together a more just and humane future. All right, uh, so our fifth speaker today is Sally. Welcome Sally, who is a family member and has done our Stepping Stones program. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you Chloe for asking me to talk today and giving me the chance to tell you about our journey with our son who took methamphetamines or ice. Um, I thought it was something that you only read about in the news but it was, um, wasn't. <laughs> um, it was a shock because he was not only a happy, lovely child who loved sport, was active, active in um, many areas of his life. He was a football umpire. He <coughs> grew up to be a carpenter. He worked in the mines. He worked on major projects as a, um, in Melbourne and Canberra. Um, but he seemed to start taking amphetamines from what we can gather now for, um, to self-medicate an undiagnosed ADHD condition. And um, it obviously got out of hand. Um, so we started setting about trying to help him. Um, it was a, a quagmire for us to try and get, uh, to get him into a psychiatrist who didn't want to see someone who, you know, and they'd just say, no, so, sorry, can't take more people. Trying to get him into drug rehab or detox and trying to get him to agree to trust someone to help him because he'd worked out a way to help himself even though it wasn't really working. Um, so we got on to Chloe and we spoke to various support lines and you'd always speak to different people, but Chloe was always there for us and family drug support was amazing and just gave us a pathway and helped us to understand that we couldn't change him, but we could change ourselves. He was living at home with us, so we started to put up boundaries for him. And this led to um, boundaries in things we weren't prepared to accept. And this led to erratic behaviour. The police would get called if he, if he raised his voice and you know became unacceptable in his behaviour. And um, you probably know that story of what happens when you start putting in boundaries, so I won't go into it. But um, it reached a point where one, he was living in his car because he wasn't allowed home because of an intervention order. Um, and he had stopped at a roadblock and the car had been taken off the road. So he was walking by the road. He rang me up and asked if I could, <laughs> sorry, asked if I could pick him up. And I, I went, as I got in the car to pick him up, he'd been walking for a while. It was a really hot day. His shirt was off and <laughs> sorry about this. And he looked quite broken. 
But as I got in the car to pick him up, this song came on the radio. I don't know if you know this Glen Campbell song. Um, if you see your brother walking by the road, I won't oh. sing it. <laughs> Seriously. And um, it's, it says you've got to show a bit of kindness. And I realise no one shows these people kindness. They're not welcome in the shops or in the streets. They're not welcome at cafes. They're not welcome at the station. No one welcomes them. They're not even allowed at home because of the intervention order. And um, the police find them problematic to deal with, and the hospitals find them hard work. There, you know, there is no, and as my doctor said, even the doctors don't like them because they're so difficult. So there is nowhere that they are found shown kindness. So on this day, my daughter and I decided that we were going to help him. He couldn't ask for help. He, because he was worried about losing control of what he was doing, but he needed help and he wanted the help. So we we decided then we were going to help him. And so we took him, we, first we took him to Frankston Hospital and they saw him very quickly, but they said, um, he said, you know, can I get Dexys here? Because that's what was working for him. And they said no healthcare provider in Australia would give you Dexys. <laughs> so he walked out. And, um, and we were devastated, but the next day we took him to my doctor who actually specialises in this area, but I'd never been able to get my son there before. And my doctor gave him a, a course of medication, baclofen for the cravings, olanzapine for the psychosis, and metazapine to help him sleep. And he said he's had 60% success rate with this regimen with, with drug users, getting them off drugs if they want to get off drugs. And so my daughter and I started the hardest six weeks of my life <laughs> as we took him through detox. And uh, I mean, it was, it meant getting up at six o'clock in the morning to hit golf balls with him because that sort of calmed him down and he liked hitting golf balls. Or sometimes we'd just have to leave the house at a minute's notice because something had triggered him and we had to get him out of the house. And so we're lucky we had a place we could go to and we had a holiday house so we could take him there and we worked for ourselves so we could do it. And so we'd just go for a week and sometimes we'd drive for five hours on end in the car, playing loud music for him and just giving him his medication hoping it would kick in soon but it was really hard work but um but it it helped and then one day um, we had our first night off and we got to go to the city together and things were going well he was you know he seemed to be making a lot of sense back on track and during this time we'd have the old set would come through sorry the old my son would come through and and would go up shopping together and, and he loved cooking so he would cook the meal so there were real bonuses to to it there were little bonuses shall i say um but uh it reached the point where I would love to set up a centre where any drug user who wants help can just walk in and get help because we're, you know, we are losing the war on drugs. Drug dealing, if you speak to a police officer in this field, they will tell you, a friend of mine told me, he said as fast as we close one, one drug lab down, six more pop up. And he said, we, we just can't win that war. But what we should be doing is making it easier for them to find help. Be so I suggested, I've actually suggested to Peninsula Health at Frankston Hospital, that they set up what I consider a kindness centre where drug users who want to get off drugs can just walk in the door. And it's not like a hospital, it's like a, a house, a welcoming house. They can walk in the door, make themselves a toasted sandwich and a coffee or whatever they want. And the person in this kitchen who can help them, who's there to help them make their stuff is a, is a peer support worker or a mental health worker. And they can, they can guide them to this program. This program is offered there and they can be given these drugs if they want to get off drugs. And if they stick to the program in going there, if they don't have support, they, they will be given um, supported detox in this center. And then they can do yoga and meditation. They can do activity groups like walking, go to a gym. So they have a structured program if they want it. There's like a men's shed so they can build furniture and they can sell it to make money for the facility. So they actually have purpose in their life because they don't have purpose in their lives. Mm -hmm often and um, 
And these are just normal people, like our son was a productive member of society who just went off the wrong rails for whatever reason. And they just need help to get back on the rails. And this would give them an easy, I've considered cheap, you know, quite cost effective opportunity to do this. Um, I have proposed that this be built as part of Frankston Hospital building a half a billion dollar development and I've proposed that this be included in it. I'm a consumer rep there so I talked to them a little bit and I've asked that they consider this. Um, it'll fall in the bin I know, it'll go nowhere but anyway I've asked and I think it would be helpful and I just hope one day something like this is built to show people kindness for people who just don't see much of it in their lives. And that's Thank you. All right, so our sixth speaker today is Dr. Tim Reed of the Australian Greens, uh, who's responsible for implementing the first pill testing bill in Australia in 2019. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Chloe, and thanks to Family Drug Support for inviting me. And also, uh, echo the acknowledgement of the Wurundjeri, the traditional owners, and pay respects to all their elders. And, and it's been uh, educational and really important to hear all the speakers, and especially, Sally, uh, your story. So, uh, and particularly want to acknowledge all the people here who've either lost a loved one or lived with a loved one uh, with their particular struggles with, with drugs and other substances. So, um, what I might do with my couple of minutes is, is just point to some reasons for optimism, some reasons for good news. Um, so the, the first, uh, and in no particular order, we've already heard about the medically supervised injecting room in Richmond and uh, the proposed one for the CBD. And uh, while, and this is fantastic news, uh, but um, this is just the beginning, I think, of a nibbling away at the policies of prohibition and deterrence, which have steered us in this wrong direction of judgment and tough love rather than compassion. And this, this gradual erosion, I hope, of, of these policies of prohibition and deterrence is, is the beginning of, of a new era. But there are a couple of other little signs to point to you. Uh, so these supervised injecting rooms, obviously one of the things they've got on the shelf, the main thing they've got on the shelf, is the drug naloxone or Narcan to reverse the, um, the effects of an opiate which can stop breathing. So the, the main way people die from a heroin overdose is, is by stopping breathing. You've really only got two or three minutes to get it into someone. When I was a, a, a rookie GP at Collingwood Community Health Centre in, in the last heroin epidemic in the 90s, I remember the first time I saw naloxone given, I, I was giving it was uh, through someone's genes on the, on the steps of the health centre out on Holt Street at night. And, and the bloke woke up and swore at us and staggered off. Um, and uh, so that, that was my first win there. Um, but um, uh, so, but there's a bill before Parliament uh, coming up in the lower house next week called the Drugs, Poisons and Controlled Substances Amendment Bill, which follows on from a recommendation of uh, the parliamentary inquiry a couple of years ago into drug law reform, which Fiona, did you chair it, Fiona? Or you, you no, were I just initiated it you, and I was on it. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Um, and, and also new chair of parliamentary friends for drug law reform. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this bill will make naloxone more widely available. Currently it is handed out and distributed, but because the law hasn't been properly amended, it's not legal for someone given naloxone strictly to give it to their family so they can give it to them if they're unconscious and so on. Hopefully that's a law that's routinely broken, but, um, and you know, even back in the 90s, we would occasionally slip someone illegally some naloxone so their mum or dad could give it to them if they found them unconscious. Uh, but getting this through will hopefully mean that naloxone isn't just available in some big expensive injecting rooms, but rather it's it's more widely available where, wherever someone drops due to an overdose. Uh, so that's that's the second bit of good news. Um, and 
Um, just the, the third thing, just a bit off to the side, uh, is, is you perhaps aware we've been pushing for uh, introduction of pill testing in Victoria and just to um, uh, pick up Chloe's theme that the bill hasn't been um, passed let alone implemented but we've written it down and waved it around right that's the, that's the first step in politics is to wave your bill around and um, but, but just quietly early last year the Department of Health website uh, started alerting people to dangerous pills that are circulating, such as the UPS batch. Just on the quiet, it's just popped up on the health department website. Oh, look, here's a bit of a, a health warning for you folks, which must have come from the police. Something they've refused to do because it would send the wrong message, of course. But very nice to see that a little bit of sanity is just leaking through the bureaucracy. And this is, you know, I think as Fiona said, it's, a, it's not a straight linear upward course, drug law reform, it's a bit of an up and down, but there's a, a few little ups to point you, point you to. And, and um, it, in line with this uh, bill liberalising the use of naloxone, the, the next up I want to see, and I'll, we'll take anything actually, but, but one I'd like to draw people's attention to is a shortage of methadone prescribers and prescribers of other opiate replacement therapy and um, uh, the need for that to be free. So I'll stop there and thank you all very much. Our final speaker for today is a David Lindbrick um, of the Liberal Democrats. Thanks so much, David. Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chloe, and thank you to Family Drug Support for inviting me again to talk here today. And um, I'd like to first acknowledge the, the families who uh, have shared this, their stories, like Sally earlier. Um, it takes such incredible courage to talk about something so personal. But the reason that someone does that is to have an effect on other people and to inform other people. And I remember last time I was, I had the privilege of coming along here and listening to people's stories. Um, it had an effect on me because I heard their stories. And you know, I've, I've, I'm a father. I've got three children of my own. They're quite young at the moment. But I imagine, you know, what might happen in the future, and the things that. Uh, I might do, how might I react? And I hear these real stories and, um, you know, families that love their, love their children and they have these problems that run out of control. And so family, organisations like Family Drug Support play such a critical role in helping uh, parents uh, navigate these sort of terrible issues. But of course, as we've heard, there's, there's barriers to that. Some of those barriers are around access uh, to access to services, as we've heard a bit about, um, access to treatments, um, which, you know, as uh, Dr. Reid said before, like there's some reason for optimism there, you know, drugs like naloxone are, are going to become more widely available, which will save lives. And it's such a simple thing, uh, you know, it sort of makes me angry that it hasn't been done earlier, but, you know, it's happening, so that's reason for optimism. And, um, you know, we've also heard, you know, uh, apparently today we have a new parliamentary <laughs> friends of drug law reforms. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's wonderful as well. Um, we'll have to talk a bit more about how that will work, but... Um, you can be secretary. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll have to take the notes. Um, but one of the one of the things that I heard last time and I, and I heard again today is uh, another barrier, which is the law itself. And... Um, my team and I did a lot of thinking about this after the last time I came here, and we, we were thinking about, you know, what's the, what's the minimum way that we can shift when someone comes into contact with the police, when they've got drugs, when they possess drugs or they're using drugs, how can we, what's the minimum way or the most widely acceptable way that we can move that from a situation where it's about police courts and prisons and move that towards families, health professionals and community organisations. And so what we've done is we're in the process of drafting a private members bill called a diversion reform bill. And what we're looking at, we're hoping to introduce it in a few months. What that will do at the moment, police have 
the discretion to either charge someone, which they do in a surprisingly large number of cases, or divert them for uh, access to services such as you know, treatments. Um, I would hope they would have access to harm reduction services, harm reduction information. Some of them might want to uh, take up detox, or maybe they just need uh, some extra support in other ways, because it's not always, the, the drugs might be the problem that's surfacing, but maybe there's other problems there that the drugs is just a symptom of those problems. And so what this bill does is effectively takes away that discretion. So the police can't charge anyone anymore. They would be referred to a service where they assess them. And so we're looking at that. We're consulting widely with a number of organisations to get their input into you know, what are some of the problems with this? How might we be able to better implement it? And if you've got ideas on that, then um, please feel free to con reach out to Ash from my team or myself and we're happy to consult with you. But I do share Tim's uh, optimism. I think that there are um, movements in, in the right direction. And, um, you know, I wanna hope, I wanna be able to join with other people who we may disagree on other things, but I think that we do all agree that change needs to happen in this space, in the, in the areas of the law. So thank you very much. So, so this more or less brings us to the end of today. Um, and I'm just so grateful um, to see so many people here um, that chose to participate um, in this event and, and keep this conversation going, which is ultimately you know, moving towards better outcomes for families, drug users and people in the community just generally. Uh, I quickly need to mention our sponsors for tonight or today, I suppose it is as well, um, which is we've got Indivio and Camparis for helping um, bring this event to you. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Um, before we finish off, I think we had an offer from Peter who wanted to say a few words um, at the end of the event, is that right? Very quick two minutes. Would you still be interested in that? Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter. <laughs> um, my name is Peter Wern, and I chair the Yarra Drug and Health Forum, but I also work as a project manager for an Aboriginal mental health and drug and alcohol project called Watha Dobra. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge two Aboriginal elders that are very important to me, Uncle Colin Hunter from the Wurundjeri Council, and also Uncle Bobby Nichols, who's a Yorta Yorta man, who's the grandson of uh, Sir, Sir Pastor Doug Nichols. I just want to say uh, today, hearing parents and volunteers speak about their lived experience just changes my life every time I hear people speak about their lived experience. And like David, it lives in my heart more importantly than my mind. And I want to say to all the families that have been touched by the scourge of drugs, that the real scourge is the fact that the rest of us have abandoned you and have not reached out to you in any meaningful way to say that you have legitimacy and that we love you. And we do. You should feel no shame and you should feel no embarrassment for what is going on for you and your loved ones. And I apologise that you are made to feel that way. It's a disgrace. I'll just correct one thing that was said earlier on. Drug and alcohol is not a health issue. It's a human rights issue. Very fundamentally. And you folk and your families have human rights. And I live for the day when you can proudly claim those rights without any sense of shame or embarrassment. And I applaud Tony and the work that he's done. I want to acknowledge the lady that left earlier who told me that her child had died years ago from a drug overdose. And uh, I, I, I just, my heart breaks when I hear people tell me that. I'm a granddad, and I don't know what that would feel like, to bury a child before you have to bury yourself. So I acknowledge you all here today. You need to be heard, and today you've been heard. This day is for you. And I applaud the work of people like Chloe, who's an absolute angel, but also an intelligent, articulate, strong advocate 
for you and your families. So thank you for that. Cheers. Okay.